So the question is, how do you become satisfied? Is it just consuming more fat? Is it eating more nutrient-dense foods? Is it making sure that your digestion is working like you have enough bile to extract these fat-soluble nutrients? And these are all things that I've talked about in other videos, but I haven't talked about the biggest thing that's going to satisfy your hunger. And this is based on a recent book with some fascinating new information. I'm going to put that link down below. But this book talks about this one concept called protein leverage hypothesis. And basically they studied insects and they found that certain insects will continue to eat until their protein requirements are met. And if you put these insects on a low protein diet, they will overeat, okay, to get that protein need. And this is very interesting because one of the advices that I give people is to make sure you have your salad first before you consume your protein, because if you have your protein first, the odds of you finishing that salad are much less. So protein tends to make you satisfied, and it's really not the protein, it's the amino acids in the protein. So let's just take a look at protein and what, what actually it does for your body. Well, number one, you know, it replenishes your muscles, your ligaments, your tendons, your collagen, your skin, your bone, but not just that. All of your enzymes, not just for digestion, but all the biochemistry is made with proteins. Your cells are made out of proteins. Your blood is protein. Your Most of your hormones are protein. So as a survival mechanism, there's a lot of importance on protein, especially since you don't store your protein. And so if you don't eat protein, where does it come from, right? Well, it comes from your muscles, but not initially, okay? When you do prolonged fasting, where does a lot of your protein come from? It comes from damaged protein, and your body actually has a, this amazing thing that recycles damaged protein, and this condition or this mechanism is called autophagy. So when you do prolonged fasting, because protein is so important, it'll take that damaged protein and convert it into... Uh, amino acids to make new proteins. And so this is very, very therapeutic. So just as a side note, if you do prolong fasting and you don't feel very good, it could mean that you need, you know, certain nutrients like B vitamins, electrolytes, salt, but it also could mean that you might need amino acids. So I don't recommend taking protein, but I would recommend if you don't feel very good when you do prolonged fasting is to take as a supplement uh, not throughout the day, but maybe once or twice a day, uh, an, a good amino acid complex. Now, if you have just the right amount of amino acids, uh, it won't then convert to sugar. And this is one of the problems uh, with consuming too much protein. The excess is not stored. It's converted to sugar. And so if you eat just the right amount of protein that your body needs, it will replace the body tissue and give your body what it needs, but without turning it into sugar or fat. And as far as human requirements goes, that would be, if we're looking at pounds, you would multiply uh, 0.64 times how much you weigh, okay? And that would be the number of grams of protein you would need per day. If we're talking about kilograms, you would multiply 1.6 times your kilograms in weight, and that's how many grams of protein you need per day. Now, that's just on average. It could be a little bit more if you're younger and you're an athlete. could be a little bit less. Now, what's really interesting about this whole topic is recently I bought two horses, right, because I live on a farm. And, um, you know, trying to figure out what to feed a horse because going into buying horses, there's a couple of conditions that everyone says you have to be careful not to overfeed them because they get things like hay belly, where their belly becomes extracted because they're eating too much grain. They might get this condition called laminitis, which is like this inflammation of their foot, which in humans would be comparable to having this inflamed tissue right beneath your fingernail that's connected to your, your finger. Could you imagine having that inflamed and trying to walk on it? And so a very uh, severe form of that is called foundering, where you have this inflamed foot, and then all of a sudden this uh, horse can't walk. And then you get what's called a lame horse, you know, which is a very terrible condition. So I wanted to know a little bit more about what's really behind all this stuff. So I found a fascinating a vet that doesn't recommend feeding your horses grain. And apparently, and this all makes sense to me because I'm in the, the health field, the arthritis that the horses get, the ulcers that they also get, 
is all coming from either too many grains or when a horse is put on um, new spring grass. It's very, very high in fructose, where if you eat too much fructose, you can get inflammation and create all these problems. It happens in humans all the time. We're on this fructose diet and we have way too much of it. Well, horses are the same thing. Normally in the wild, the horse is not confined to a barn or a, a pasture. They're able to travel, migrate, and eat not just grass, but eat legumes and other things. And of course, with a lot of exercise to burn that off. And so with horses, they'll continue to eat until their protein requirement is satisfied, right? And unfortunately, in the spring, the grass is very high in carbs, it doesn't have much protein, and so they will just keep eating and eating and eating until they get enough uh, protein. Well, this vet gave me some really good advice to feed the horses legumes, right? And uh, alfalfa is one, but the other one is soy. Soya is a legume that has basically twice as much protein as grass. And of course, I'm very much against consuming soy for humans, but apparently when you have soybean meal, they take out, they extract the oils that oxidize, and that's where you get that high omega-6 fatty acid, which is inflammatory, and you're left with this product with amino acids. And of course, I would also try to recommend getting the organic blend. But the point is, if you feed these horses legumes, right, they'll get the protein and they won't overeat. And apparently he's been doing this for many years, working with lots of clients and has had a lot of great success with these problems with horses. So the same thing that's happening with humans is happening with animals. For some reason, we have this idea we have to feed horses grains and they have to be in a barn and they have to do this and that. But you just want to look at nature. What do they do in nature naturally? I mean, when someone goes on a diet, what do they do? They, they search out how to do a diet. They go to Google and um, to handle um, an appetite, they'll say, well, make sure you drink more water, eat more fiber to fill you up, and make sure you have um, a lot of small snacks through the day to prevent overeating. I do remember when I used to have a carb breakfast, man, would I, I would be hungry an hour and a half later. I would be hungry in the evening, right? And then when I switched to a protein breakfast, which I, I don't do that now because I fast until lunch, but the point is when I had eggs or meat, hamburger or steak for breakfast, boy, that really handled my hunger. I was satisfied. I felt the best. And that was simply because I was achieving my protein requirements. Without going over the requirements, just had enough and I did really well. Now, just to fully grasp this information, it's really important to understand the translation of those grams into quantities of protein. And to get more information on that, I put this video up right here. Check it out.